questions in the packets you have, they're green. Please fill out as it helps us to uh, plan for the ne next year what kind of lectures we're going to offer. Um, there's also a note card in your packet, and if you have a question, we'll pick up the note cards at the end of the lecture uh, so that the doctors can answer. Uh, please don't, we do, we do not accept questions during the physician's lecture, so we can have it pretty go smoothly. Um, the restrooms are across the breezeway in the other building across, and you'll see some signage leading you to the restrooms. Uh, I want to thank our partners, uh, the ITS department here at City of Hope, Becky Andrews from the Community Education Department, and Marketing Communications puts this together every year. And we do look at the evaluations, so please complete them. We'll now start our um, basic information. Um, I do want to tell you that this year is City of Hope's centennial year, and uh, we're 100 years old. We're very proud of that. Uh, if you have a story booth back there, and tell your story on video, and we'll put it on our website to tell people about session speakers tonight. Um, Dr. Marwan Faki is director of City of Hope's Gastrointestinal Cancer Program and a professor for the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research. Dr. Faki previously was professor of medicine and co-director of the GI Oncology Program at the University of Michigan. Prior to this, he served as an associate professor, gastrointestinal oncology section leader, and chair of the, D of the GI disease site research group at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo. Dr. Faki completed his internship and residency in internal medicine at Wayne State University in Detroit. He furthered his training with a hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Faki's clinical research interest center on therapeutic, and prevention strategies in patients with colorectal cancer. Dr. Julian Sanchez is our second speaker. He serves as assistant clinical professor of surgery as well as surgeon for the Division of Surgical Oncology at City of Hope. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Florida and his medical degree from Tufts University in Boston. Dr. Sanchez went on to finish his residency in general surgery at the University of South Florida, Tampa. He then completed a research fellowship as well as a clinical fellowship in colorectal surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Sanchez's research interests are focused on patients with gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. James Lynn serves as assistant clinical professor of medical specialties and staff physician in gastroenterology. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Anthropology and Human Biology from Emory University in Atlanta, and a Master's degree in Population Dynamics and Reproductive Biology from Johns Hopkins. He received his medical degree from University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Dr. Lynn went on to complete his residency in internal medicine from UC Irvine and his fellowship in gastroenterology from John H. Stroger Jr. Hospital of Cook County in Chicago. And I'd like to first introduce Dr. Lynn. Good evening. Uh, my name is James Lynn. I'm a gastroenterologist here at City of Hope, and uh, my talk today is going to be on uh, colorectal uh, cancer screening. So uh, I have no financial disclosures for this discussion today. Uh, a little introduction. Okay. A little introduction. Um, colorectal cancer, as we know, is a major cause of uh, cancer-associated morbidity and uh, mortality in the United States. Lifetime incidence of uh, colorectal cancer for patients at average risk is uh, 5%, with a majority of these cancers occurring after the age of 90, I mean 50. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so colorectal cancer death rates for both uh, males and females have been, uh, it's the blue line here, have been declining over the uh, past few decades. But still, it's a pretty prevalent cancer. Uh, estimated new cases of uh, colon cancers for male, it's the uh, third leading uh, cancer. And uh, same thing for females after uh, breast and uh, lung cancer. 
And it's also a major cause of uh, cancer-related uh, deaths. Um, for males, uh, the leading cause is lung and uh, prostate, but colon cancer is the uh, third leading cause. And for females, it's, uh, again, lung and breast, uh, followed by colon cancer. So the majority of uh, colorectal cancer uh, comes in uh, patients with average risk. Um, about 30% of patients may have a family history of uh, colon cancer, and a small subset have a uh, rare genetic syndromes. So what are the risk factors for colorectal cancers? The risk factors that we know, one is the uh, personal or family history of a colorectal cancer or a history of a colorectal polyps. Uh, a second risk factor is uh, inflammatory bowel disease, such as uh, Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, a third risk factor, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, is actually uh, race. Um, the fourth is the genetic syndromes, which, we, um, which are pretty rare, uh, such as uh, familial adenomatous uh, polyposis and uh, the Lynch syndrome. And there are lifestyle factors uh, which put you at uh, increased risk for uh, colon cancer. Uh, things such as a uh, low fiber, high fat diet, alcohol consumption, uh, tobacco use, uh, obesity, and lack of uh, regular physical activity. So a uh, common question that we always get as a gastroenterologist is, uh, what's a polyp? Um, a polyp is a uh, growth in the uh, lining of the uh, colon wall. So what happens with uh, cell cycles, they are to promote the cells to grow. This is the uh, green arrow here. And there are certain factors in the um, cells um, that suppress cell growth. That's the uh, red. So what happens with these uh, polyp formation is uh, these um, called oncogenic mediators, the uh, stuff that promotes cell growth, um, you may develop mutations, and it keeps on promoting cell growth. And um, the red, we call the uh, tumor suppressor factors, which are kind of the breaks on the cell uh, cycle growth, is uh, they may develop mutations, so the breaks are off, so nothing's really signaling the cells to stop growing. And there's various mutations which you can develop, which leads to a small polyp and over uh, many years, the polyps can grow and eventually turn into cancer. And this whole sequence from the small adenoma to the carcinoma is about, um, it could take upwards of a, a decade. So I'm going to talk a little about uh, colon cancer screening. Um, <laughs> this is not available at City of Hope yet, but we're still hoping our uh, colleagues at uh, Cal, uh, Caltech would invent this one day. Um, so benefits of screening. Uh, one is uh, cancer prevention. If you remove the precancerous polyps, you can prevent the cancer. And the second is uh, improved survival. If you can detect the cancer at an early stage, the chances of long-term survival are increased. And uh, this is... Uh, data from the SEER database, which shows the five-year survival of uh, colon cancer patients. So if you have localized disease, which means the cancer is confined to the colon, uh, your five-year survival is about 90%. But once it advances to a regional disease where the cancer has spread uh, to the local lymph nodes, the five-year survival drops down to 68%. And once it metastasizes to uh, other organ sites, your five-year survival is down to 11%. So if you, goal of screening is um, to detect the cancer early or detect the precancerous polyps, so the chances of uh, long-term survival are better. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, two categories of uh, colorectal cancer screening tests. Um, they come in two forms. One is tests that detect precancerous polyps in cancer. They include a colonoscopy, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, a double contrast barium enema, and a CT colonography, or more commonly known as the uh, virtual colonoscopy. And then there is a subset of tests that primarily detect uh, cancer. Um, one is the uh, fecal occult blood test. The second is uh, fecal uh, immunochemical test, and the third is a stool DNA test. So I'm going to talk about these uh, stool-based tests first. 
Um, the fecal occult blood test, you probably heard of this. This is the one um, where you have to give the physician a stool sample. It usually requires uh, three separate stool samples and it detects uh, blood in the stools. And um, if this is a form of uh, screening that you're gonna pursue, it's recommended to be done on a yearly basis. Uh, the fecal immunochemical test is another um, test, stool test, which uh, detects blood in the stool. Uh, this is felt to be a little bit more uh, specific in detecting a lower GI tract. Uh, um, and this um, is also recommended to be done on an annual basis. Uh, as opposed to the fecal cold blood test, uh, you can probably get away with just doing a one to two stool samples for this test. The third test is the stool DNA test. Um, the theory behind this is uh, this is a polyp here, and when the stools are passing, uh, you shed cells. And the stool DNA test is supposed to pick up these uh, various mutations in the cells, and that's what they look for. Um, but there are limitations to this test. Um, the test sensitivity is based on the panel of markers which they test for, so it may not detect all colorectal cancers because the uh, colorectal cancer is various mutations, so it all depends on what mutations that they actually check for. And if you have a stool DNA test that's positive, you have to follow this up with a colonoscopy, not covered by most insurances, and um, we don't know what the screening intervals we should be doing these stool DNA tests yet. Should we be doing them annually? Should we do them every two years, three years, four years? Uh, no one really knows yet. So this test, um, it's available, but it's not commonly done. So now I'm gonna talk about tests that can detect, detect both uh, precancerous polyps and uh, uh, cancer. And the first is a uh, double contrast barrier enema. Um, this is a test, uh, it's a radiologic test. Um, it does require a complete bowel prep, and what they do is uh, they insufflate your colon with uh, a radio contrast material, and they take x-rays, so you can get a good detailed outlining of the whole colon right here. And here you can see the colon wall, and here's a polyp within the colon. So if you have a positive test on the double contrast barium enema, you follow this up with a colonoscopy. Uh, if this is done, it's recommended to be done on a five-year basis. Uh, the next test I'm gonna talk about is uh, CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy. Um, this test also does require a bowel prep. Um, this is an image of the polyp, and this is what the image of the polyp looks like on the uh, CT colonography. Um, if you do have a polyp that's more than six millimeters on the CT colonography, uh, it is uh, followed up with a colonoscopy for the uh, polyp removal. Uh, the risks for the uh, CT colonography are low. There are rare reported cases of uh, perforations, and um, if this is chosen, it's recommended to be done on a five-year basis. But there are some patients to CT colonography. Um, on the previous image here, this is a, uh, a pedunculated polyp, so you can clearly see this. But sometimes uh, polyps can be uh, very flat. It can be very flush to the wall and it may not be readily apparent on the CT colonography, so that's something that could be missed. It does require a bowel prep. Uh, any positive findings, you have to follow it up with a colonoscopy. Uh, it has limited availability and it's not covered by most insurers yet. Um, and the other issue becomes um, the risk of a radiation exposure. Um, CT colonography, um, there is a, it is a CT exam, and there is a significant uh, radiation exposure. And if you do this, it's recommended to be done on an every five year basis from 50 to uh, 75. Uh, there may be a large cumulative radiation exposure. So it's, um, the risk, it's still, um, we're not so sure about that. And, a lot of the times on the CT colonographies, you may find uh, small polyps that are less than six millimeters, and we still don't know, you know how to manage this. Um, if you do find one small polyp, should you follow it up with another CT colonography in two years, four years? Um, if you find four or five small polyps, what do you do? Do you follow it up with a colonoscopy? So there's still a lot of questions about 
CT colonography and how to use this. So the next test I'm going to talk about is uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy. Um, this also requires a uh, bow prep, and uh, a sigmoidoscopy is a flexible camera, and we insert it through the uh, rectum, and we examine about one-third of the colon up to the uh, descending colon here. And um, the protective effect of the sigmoidoscopy is limited to the area that we examine. So the proximal colon here uh, is not examined, so the protective effect is really limited to the colon. And finally, the one that you always hear about is uh, colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is capable of uh, examining the whole colon and also at the same time removing any uh, precancerous polyps. It does require a bowel prep. Uh, we do this uh, procedure on the conscious sedation. So we give you um, a medication, a combination of a painkiller and sedative, uh, relaxes you and allows us to do this uh, examination. Um, but it does require you, uh, a driver, to bring you to the uh, appointment and someone to take you home. There are risks associated with this procedure. It's a small risk of bleeding, infection, and a perforation. It's usually when it's uh, removing a large polyp. And a colonoscopy is recommended to be done on a 10-year basis. Two main uh, society recommendations. The multi-society recommendations from GI organizations, the American Cancer Society, the American College of uh, Radiology. The other uh, uh, screening guidelines from the United States uh, Preventive Service Task Force. Um, they're pretty much in agreement on most stuff. The only areas uh, where there's disagreement is the stool DNA test. Um, for the United States Preventive Service Task Force, they feel that there's insufficient evidence to recommend this. Holonography, the same thing. So when I uh, started this lecture, we talked about uh, colon cancer risk factors, and uh, one of the risk factors I uh, mentioned was race. Uh, this is data from the United States. Um, the incidence rate of uh, colorectal cancer is actually the highest in African-American males and African-American females, followed by Caucasians. And when you look at proximal colorectal cancer rates, dark blue line here, and there's also disparities in uh, colorectal cancer mortality. That's with the treatment for colon cancer. For African Americans, this is the, uh, the yellow line here. They have a higher mortality rate for localized disease, regional disease, and uh, metastatic disease. So based on this, the uh, American Society of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy and the American College of Gastroenterology recommend screening for African Americans at the age of uh, 45. So uh, another high risk uh, category is patients with a family history. So if you have a family history of uh, colorectal cancer or an adenoma in a first degree relative less than the age of 60 or two first degree relatives at any age, you begin screening at age 40 or 10 years before the youngest case in the uh, immediate family. And the recommended screening method is a colonoscopy. Um, if you have colorectal cancer in a first degree relative greater than 60, uh, age to begin is uh, 50. Um, the next is the, uh, the high risk category is the uh, um, the genetic syndromes. One is the familial adenomatous polyposis, and these patients we start screening at uh, age 10 to 12. And HMPCC, or the hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome, or more commonly known as the Lynch syndrome, we begin screening at the age of 20 to 25 years. And uh, inflammatory bowel disease is another high risk uh, is a risk factor for uh, colon cancer. That's patients with uh, ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. So for these patients, your cancer risk really increases uh, significantly eight years after the onset of pancolitis, meaning the whole colon was inflammation, or 12 to 15 years after the onset of left-sided colitis, or uh, part of the colon was uh, affected. 
and colonoscopies recommended to be done on a one to two year basis. Um, so I know we've been talking a lot about the importance of screening. Um, remember a few years ago, I uh, did the same talk and uh, one of the questions from the audience was from an 80 year old gentleman and uh, his question was, uh, he was getting colonoscopies every year by his gastroenterologist and he was wondering when he can stop. Uh, we couldn't really go into full details about his medical history, um, but it brought up a good point. Um, just as it's important to know when to start screening, screening, and there's various options for colon cancer screening, so there's really no excuse not to get screened. And uh, early detection of colon cancer improves long-term survival. Thank you. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Sanchez, and uh, he's going to discuss uh, surgical treatments for colon cancer. Hello, and welcome to City of Hope. I'm Dr. Julian, colorectal surgeon. It's great to see all of you here today, especially a lot of my uh, former and current patients with us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the surgical therapy for colon cancer. And I kind of take over where Dr. Lin left off. Dr. Lin usually does a diagnosis with the colonoscopy and the screening programs. And then once a the patient's had the diagnosis for cancer, they're usually sent to see me for a little discussion about the role of surgery in that patient's cancer. So just a little bit about our area of interest. The colon three to five feet of the intestine. The intestine is one large tube, pretty much, from the mouth to the anus. And the colon encompasses the last five feet of it. The job of the colon is largely to absorb water. So most of the absorption of all your nutrients occurs here in the small intestine and in the stomach. And that's where all the vitamins and the proteins get absorbed. By the time the nutrients or the food and the waste gets to the colon, it's just that food travels along the colon until it becomes a solid stool we're used to seeing when you have a bowel movement out through the rectum. So as Dr. Lin was saying, the lifetime risk for anyone to develop colon cancer is actually about one in 20. There's just over 142,000 patients diagnosed with colon cancer each year, but thankfully there's over a million survivors. That just goes to show that this is more prone to develop colon cancer. So if you look at the slide, the things here on the right are things you can't really control. Age, genetics, family history, and other comorbidities. The stuff on the other side of the screen are things you can control. And this is a list you've probably seen on any talk in this auditorium on any disease, diabetes, and the majority of patients that have polyps are also much older. Having a family history also increases your risk, as Dr. Lin told us. Having just one relative with colon rectal cancer increases your risk of colon cancer about two to three times. Having three relatives with colon cancer in risk increases your risk 10 times. So obviously family history has something to do with your development of colon cancer. So colorectal cancers develop over time. During this transformation process, there can be over 100 individual gene mutations that occur to make that normal cell become a cancer cell. So as Dr. Lin eloquently taught us, when do we start screening? Well, it depends on your family history, it depends on other comorbidities, and it depends on your ethnicity. But in general, I'd say about 50. The ways to screen, as he showed us, were stool cards and colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is Again, my preferred. I have to agree with Dr. Lin and my, with my bias as well. And the reason why I like colonoscopy is because not only can you see something, but you can treat it. If it's caught early enough, you don't ever need to see me as a surgeon, because Dr. Lin will take care of the pre-cancer or even the very early cancer before you even have to have a surgeon look at you. Now, when you do get the diagnosis for cancer, unfortunately, and you come to the surgeon, the first question I ask is the same question your neighbor is going to ask. What's your stage? Well, the stage of colon cancer depends on three main things, and those of you who uh, are my patients will be the tumor, the lymph nodes, and metastasis. So when I look at tumor size, I don't care about how big the tumor is. I don't care if it's the size of the peanut or the size of a walnut. What I care about is what, how deep do the roots of the tumor go. I think of a polyp as kind of a tree. When Dr. Lin does the colonoscopy, he takes a leaf off that tree as a biopsy. I don't know about the size of that tree until I look at the roots of the tree, and that's what surgery does. Surgery actually takes out the whole tumor, roots and all. The next thing I look at is the lymph nodes. Just like you get lymph nodes here in your neck when you get sick, you also have lymph nodes throughout your colon. And the lymph nodes are the first stops, or the pit stops, that the cancer travels to before it goes to the rest of the body. So by evaluating the lymph nodes, we can see if the cancer has had the chance to spread beyond just the colon. 
Lastly is metastasis, and metastasis just means, well, has it already made that spread? Has it already gone from the colon to the lymph nodes to some other organ? Usually it's the lungs or the liver. Once a patient gets diagnosed, the next thing we try to see is, well, has it already made that spread? And the best way to do that for us is to get a CT scan. A CT scan is an image of your body from the chest down to the abdomen where we can cut you like a bread loaf and see the different in the images in serial detail. In this image here, you can see a typical colon cancer here on the left side of this patient's body. What we don't want to see is this. And this is a liver full of tumor. So these are areas where the tumor has spread or metastasized from the primary tumor in the colon over to the liver. This would be a stage four. So why do we care so much about stage? And a stage one tumor, two or three, you do much better than a later stage tumor. So when the patients come to me, we have a diagnosis of cancer. We've already said what their stage is as much as we can. So the next step is, well, what do we do next? And the next step is surgery. The goal for surgery is to remove that tumor and all those lymph nodes. The reason why is because I want to see, well, how deep are those roots of that tumor? And I want to see, well, what do the lymph nodes look like? Are they involved? And the only way to accurately do that is to take all of that out and look at it under the microscope. So there's three different kinds we can do, three different types of surgery that we can do to assess this. The first is a traditional or open surgery where there's an incision along the midline of your, of your stomach or your abdomen, and we take out the tumor and physically fire technology or uh, more recently adopted techniques. There is robotic. I'll go at a portion of the robot, and whatever I do, the robot does as well. So it's actually quite sophisticated and excellent technology. Here's a little video of a robotic surgery. Um, I'll show you just a little bit of it so you can kind of get the idea of what it's like. The dissection continues posteriorly, utilizing only monopole. So here's uh, we're dissecting the robot with the robot. We're dissecting the rectum, and we use electrocautery or electricity to cut away some of the tissue, and we are uh, dissecting the area away. We're taking out the whole rectum. We're taking out all the lymph nodes and the tumor all together in one shot. The lateral attachments are taken down. So next. as you can see, the robots uh, allows you to, the, the flexibility to uh, take out the, the organ the and the tumor with minimal trauma to the surrounding organs and separating the rectum from the vagina. Then the resection. It can be noted that this woman... After people ask me, well, what's my rectum. stage? The second most commonly asked question is, well, will I need an ostomy? Sometimes it's a colostomy, sometimes it's an ileostomy. Some people just refer to it as a bag. But either way, what that means is a section of the intestine that comes out through the skin, and that's everyone's primary fear. I would say a lot of people's primary fear when they first find out they have colorectal cancer. Well, thankfully, most people don't need an ostomy. And those that do often depend on where the tumor is located. What I care about most when determining if patients are going to need an ostomy or not is these little muscles here. These muscles here are called the sphincter muscles, and those are the muscles that allow you to hold onto your stool so you don't have an accident in the middle of Ralph's. What that happens, though, if there's a tumor involving these muscles, I have to take those muscles as part of the surgery. I wouldn't want to do a surgery that removes part of the tumor and leaves part of the tumor. If we're going to go for a cure, we're going to remove the whole tumor, even if it means removing these muscles. Now, when I remove those muscles, that eliminates the ability of someone to control their bowel movements. So if I would remove the muscles with the tumor, that patient would have bowel movements all the time without any control whatsoever. Obviously, that's not a very realistic way to live. So in those patients, we give them a colostomy. Sometimes, in select circumstances, we give a temporary os cancers. The colostomy's job is to divert waste or stool onto a bag in the skin. It's odorless. People can usually resume their normal activities. There's professional NFL football players with colostomies. I have a patient who's a professional surfer with a colostomy. Um, most people live their daily lives normally. You can see this patient here of mine. She actually uh, went to the beach <laughs> with her colostomy and is doing quite well. So what to expect after surgery? So as you can see, I will usually take out a fairly large chunk of the colon. Uh, obviously, this has some questions as far as your lifestyle at the end. Well, part of it depends on what part of this colon I take out and how much I take out. But in general, most people will have a couple more bowel movements a day. I mentioned at the beginning that the colon's job is to absorb water. So if I take out a section of the organ that absorbs water, you're going to have less available to absorb water, meaning you're your stool is going to be much more liquidy. Because of that, people have a couple more bowel moves a day. Some patients have no change and no difference whatsoever, and that makes me happy. Most patients can resume their regular activity level once they resolve their therapy from their surgery and their subsequent chemotherapy if needed. 
Most patients live a relatively normal life, which is my attraction to colorectal surgery because people get on with what all of us want. Some patients need chemotherapy depending on their stage. And every patient gets monitored very closely after their surgery to be sure cancer doesn't come back. We do that with CT scans, colonoscopies, and blood tests looking for specific antigens called CEA. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the next speaker, Dr. Fakie. Uh, Dr. Fakie uh, takes over after Dr. Lin has made the diagnosis. I've taken out the tumor, and then I turn the patient over to Dr. Fakie. Well, let's hope one day there will be no patient to be turned over to me. Uh, I'm a medical oncologist, and I tell patients I'm a chemo, but uh, my goal is certainly to get patients through uh, after diagnosis with colon cancer and after surgery, and to uh, basically help prevent the cancer from coming back. Uh, another thing that we do is basically sometimes try to help make the surger surgery easier and more complete uh, by giving treatment before surgery. So um, what I would like to do today is go over uh, management of patients with colorectal cancer, specifically uh, earlier stages and later stages of disease, uh, and how we approach these patients in a comprehensive approach, uh, and uh, what is the role of chemotherapy in those patients. Ah, oh, here we go. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lin and Dr. Sanchez, for setting the stage for me and making my job easier. Uh, you've already learned that colon cancer is a major problem in the United States. I'm, I'm sure you knew that already, or else you're not here today. Uh, it's the second cause of cancer death, death after lung cancer in the United States. Uh, it actually doesn't get the same uh, advertisement or the same problem in the United States. The good news is that there is less death from colon cancer now than there was 10 years ago and 20 years ago if you look at the overall population. The rate of death has dropped over the last 30 years by roughly half. So we have to thank Dr. Lin for colonoscopies and detecting colon cancer earlier, and we have to thank Dr. Sanchez for better surgeries. Uh, we have also made some strides on the chemotherapy side by preventing colon cancer from coming back after surgery, and that also has improved the outcome. But clearly, there's one death every 10 minutes. Uh, so after two hours after this presentation, unfortunately, approximately 12 patients have died from colon cancer this evening, and we have to do a better job. So this is a slide that shows the distribution of colon cancer. Uh, and uh, what you see here is uh, a, uh, four pieces of pie. The blue piece is the patients who present with positive lymph node involvement. Those are the tumor that start, tumors that start in the colon or rectum and spread to an adjacent gland or lymph node. Um, an earlier stage would be stage two disease. This is the tumor that is deep enough to breach into the fatty layer of the colon or rectum, but without involving lymph nodes. And then together, we have about 40% of patients. Stage three disease is about another 35, 40% of patients. And you can see that about 20% of patients will present with stage four disease. So there are a lot of patients who present with metastatic disease to the liver or to the lungs. So what is the problem? The problem is that patients actually die from metastatic disease. Uh, we have about 51,000 deaths per year. Now, these are not patients who die from complications of surgery. Very few will die from complications of surgery. These are patients who die because of recurrence of disease. Uh, they also die because they presented with metastatic disease. So if you look at the percentage of patients who eventually have metastatic disease, it's not the only 20% of patients who present with metastatic disease. It's those 20% of patients plus another absolute 20% from those who were stage 1, 2, 3 who developed a recurrence. That, is, that becomes metastatic when they present back. And there were several you know, key individuals who had their colon resected, and you hear on the news two, three years later they developed metastases in their liver. So to improve the outcome... Um, we have to improve the outcome of advanced metastatic colorectal cancer, or more important, we have to prevent metastatic colorectal cancer. So you've heard earlier about prevention by lifestyle changes. You've heard about screening. Uh, you've heard about surgery. Uh, 
also clearly need to improve the outlook of patients with a diagnosis of more advanced disease. Number one, because 20% present with that, and number two, because those who do not present with metastatic disease can develop metastatic disease. So how do we improve the outcome and how do we reduce colorectal cancer death? So one strategy is to prevent stages one, two, three to develop into metastatic disease. And that is done by using what we call adjuvant chemotherapy, treatment or a drug that is given after surgery for patients who have a high risk that the cancer would come back to prevent the cancer. Uh, and I discuss after you know, the surgery that Dr. Sanchez has done and the patient presents with me to me with a stage three disease, I say, yeah, you're here today to discuss certain treatments, and the treatment is to prevent this cancer from coming back. And then I stop there, and I say, I want to tell you that we use the term, the cancer come back, but that's a misnomer. The cancer never goes away when it comes back. So this is not a miracle that the cancer is gone, and then two years later it pops back up. Those patients have microscopic cancer that is left behind that is not detectable neither by the eye during surgery, nor is detectable by any modality such as, that, such as CT scan or PET scan. So the reason why colon cancer comes back in a patient who had a colon cancer resected and two years later or a year later it pops up in the liver or in the lungs is that this cancer actually had spread to the liver, had actually spread to the lungs, had lodged there, but is not visible. It's too small, and over time it grows and becomes detectable. Predominantly in colorectal cancer is used for patients with rectal cancer. There are very rare instances where we use it for colon cancer. We typically use it only for rectal cancer to reduce local relapse. So rectal cancer has a risk of local relapse and a risk that it will come back elsewhere. And the areas where it could come back are mostly the liver, next by lung, and then we want to reduce both local and distant relapse. Uh, so I, I'm not going to discuss in detail radiation treatment, but briefly for stage two and stage three disease, Prior to surgery, we like to give five weeks of radiation with chemotherapy because it has less toxicity if you do it before surgery than after surgery. And that will reduce the risk of relapse by half. Now, how do we know which patients to, to treat and who are the patients at risk? Um, uh, Dr. Sanchez and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Lin talked a little bit about staging. And uh, this cartoon basically shows you uh, let me see here. Do I have a pointer? No, I don't have a pointer. Okay, so this cartoon shows you the tumor and as it goes through different layers within the colon, and you see those small glands. The white gland is not involved, and when you go, when you look towards your right side, you see some lymph nodes that, that uh, become involved uh, that have these dots inside of them. So to stage rectal cancer, we typically have to do an endoscopic ultrasound or an MRI to figure out if the lymph nodes are involved and also to figure out the depth. For rectal cancer, if it's deep into the third layer, which is the fatty layer, or if it involves lymph nodes, that's stage two or three disease, and those patients will get chemoradiation prior to surgery. Also, we want to do, know before surgery that the tumor spreads. So the job of treatment, so anyone with colon or rectal cancer, we really want to do a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Another possibility is to do a PET CT. There's a big, big, big hype in the community about PET CTs. Uh, I want to assure you that PET CTs are not always better than CT scans, and they sometimes can be inferior than regular CT scans. So uh, while they may be okay in the initial staging of disease, they're not great in the follow-up of patients with chemotherapy, as some people think. Uh, but both CTs and PET CTs are appropriate for initial staging. So radiation therapy in rectal cancer for stage 2 and 3 disease, and then surgery. And after surgery, we give these patients chemotherapy. Uh, and as I said earlier, we give the radiation prior to surgery because it has less side effects than giving it after surgery. And radiation will reduce risk of relapse by 50%. Now, the chemotherapy part for preventing relapse, I'm going to lump to get chemotherapy. Is this the right choice? If you give me chemotherapy, how much percentage better do I have in improving my risk of relapse? Is it going to make me live longer? What is the percentage that it will make me live longer? And what kind of side effects do I have to pay for it? Um, so one way to start as far as prognosticating, knowing your own prognosis as a patient, is to figuring out, figure out what your stage is. 
And the stage, as has been pointed out earlier, it depends on the depth of the tumor. How deep does it go into the wall of the colon? Does it perforate? If it perforates, if it causes a nick in the wall of the, 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 the bowel, that has a much, much higher risk of relapse than a non-perforated tumor. A perforated tumor by itself, without lymph node involvement, immediately bumps up the risk of about, to about 50% of relapse. Uh, is the tumor obstructed? Are there lymph nodes involved? How many lymph nodes are involved? What is the ratio of involved lymph nodes over non-lymph nodes? All of these are important factors. So this is where we use a, a staging called TNM staging. And, and the purpose of this slide is not to read it, but to show plaque staging. And it's divided into what we call T, and T is for depth, and N is for N, which is lymph node, nodal involvement. And dependent on the number of lymph nodes and the depth of the tumor, you can basically prognosticate and stage the patients accordingly and give a different percentage risk of relapse based on database of thousands of patients. Now, this appears to be complicated, and this is the era of computers and technology, so why not use a computer software? This is called Adjuvant Online. It's a software and it's a program that is available to each one of you. You can just go home and you know, type in your link uh, adjuvantonline.com. And it gives a prognostication tool for colon cancer, breast cancer, and other cancers. And all what a patient or a physician needs to do here is put the age of the patient, put the mor morbidity, put the uh, number of lymph nodes involved, and also put the grade of the tumor, because the grade of the tumor, how ugly does it look under a microscope? Does it look aggressive or does it look like it is not too aggressive? Is an important prognostic factor. So you just need to input these data, and the computer will pop up with a risk of recurrence. So when you see here at the bottom of this state, at the, when you look at this slide here, you can see I put an age of 60 year old, I put a female, I put that she has minor medical problems, and I put the depth of invasion as T3, so it goes to the pericolonic tissue, to the fatty tissue. And this lady had quite a few lymph nodes involved, so if she had six lymph nodes involved, it gives me an option of four to 10, so I put four to 10. And she had more than 10 lymph nodes examined, and um, we did not define her histological grade. And you can see here, we death at five years of 52%. Now, the nice thing about this software, it also gives you the chances or improvement with six months of chemotherapy. If this lady was to get six months of chemotherapy, you can see that you have created a bar, which is a yellow bar, that is the number of patients who are not recurring because of chemotherapy. So the top green and, and red over there, the green is 46% alive, uh, alive and 52% died from cancer. If you do chemotherapy, you can see you still have the 46.2% who are alive, but you added another 20% of patients who are now alive because of chemotherapy. So chemo is not a wonder drug. It's not a guarantee. It doesn't tell every single patient that they're going to be cancer-free, but it improves the chances. If we use for stage 3 disease full FOX chemotherapy in general, this is a combination of two drugs, we cut the risk of relapsing by half. So if a patient's risk of having a recurrence is 60%, it becomes 30%. Now, these patients are still at risk, and they need very close observation. But this is, you're going to punch an 89-year-old with one lymph node involved, okay, and a T2 tumor not too deep. You're going to find out that that person will have almost 1% benefit by giving six months of chemotherapy. So it is a nice software. It's helpful for the patient and providers. So who benefits from adjuvant chemotherapy? In general, if the lymph nodes are involved, most of the patients will benefit significantly from therapy, exception a 98-year-old, for example, with medical problems. But, but I think it should be considered in that setting. We give six months. Why? It's not a magic number. That's what the clinical trials show us is beneficial. There, are, there is evidence that one year is no better than six months in preventing colon cancer from coming back. There is currently a study that is looking at three months versus six months to figure out if three months is adequate. We don't know that it is yet. It may turn out to be, it may not. Um, when do we start chemotherapy after colon surgery? After four to six weeks. The longer the patient delays chemotherapy, the less likely it's effective. 
If someone has stage three colon cancer and comes back five months after their surgery and say, I wanna decrease my risk, we tell him it's too, a little bit too late. It's not gonna help you right now. So we like to start it within two months from surgery, somewhere between four to eight weeks. So what is the most effective chemotherapy right now? The standard of care for high-risk colon cancer, specifically stage three, is a combination of a fluoropyrimidine, which can be a pill called Zolota or an IV called 5-FU, they are very similar, and a drug called oxaliplatin, given for six months. It reduces risk by 50%. For patients who are older, this regimen may not be better than one drug alone. It, it adds a little bit extra benefit that may not appear too significant. There's emerging evidence that those who are extreme of age do benefit from chemotherapy, but it may be better to use the milder chemotherapy for those patients, and we often use a pill for six months in that setting called Zolota. All right, so I've covered positive lymph nodes, I said those need to be treated. What about those who present with colon cancer who have stage two disease? So the tumor is deep, it goes into the third layer or it breaches into the serosa, for example. Do these get chemotherapy? I don't wanna complicate this discussion too much, but suffice it to say, we basically divide the stage two disease into high risk and low risk. The high risk are those, for example, who have a perforated colon or who, have, who come in with a full obstruction or who have under the microscope a very poorly differentiated, nasty-looking tumor that appears to be uh, you know, able to spread. Those patients may benefit from six months of chemotherapy. Those patients who do not high have high-risk features, even though they have stage two disease, where the tumor looks good grade, not nasty appearing, where there's no perforation, no obstruction, um, a number of lymph nodes has been tested and all are negative, those patients appear to benefit about only about 3% absolute difference by six months of chemotherapy in survival. And it's not clear that it is important to treat those patients, and it's an area of controversy. There are some molecular assays that we can use for those patients that we can send to look at molecular signatures that can better stratify what their risks are. But at this point, those patients are appropriate for observation, and we have a discussion with them if it's worth it to do six months of chemotherapy pills. Um, so one other thing that I ask my patients, and I, you know, even without asking me nowadays, I bring up the questions because people, and then I tell them, okay, let me tell you one thing. Why do I want to give you chemo now rather than wait for it to come back? Because I am waiting, coming back is 40%. And I'm telling them that if I give you chemo, I'm going to cut it down to 20%. So if I'm a patient, I'm thinking, hmm, that means if I don't do anything, I have a 60% chance I'm not going to have cancer come back, and why do I want to do chemotherapy, right? It makes a very, it's a very good question. Why would you take chemotherapy when you're taking it 60% of the time for nothing? That's our dilemma nowadays. We cannot cherry pick those 60 patients out of 100 who are not going to recur. So obviously we are over treating some patients. Not every patient will recur. There are assays that are being worked out so that we can know better who are the 60% who will not recur and the 40% who will recur. But until we, don't, until we know that, we have to assume that every person is at risk. Now, what I tell my patients, why do I treat you now to prevent a recurrence rather than wait for the recurrence, is that when the recurrence comes back, I likely cannot cure it anymore, all right? I'm saying likely because it's not impossible. The facts are that if you have a patient with colon cancer and you observe them after there's only typically about a 30% chance, so one in three chance, that if you find something on subsequent CAT scans, you can cut it out. So if it comes back to only 20% of those who undergo resection of their liver metastases are cancer-free 10 years later. So the truth is, if this cancer comes back, yes, we can cure it, but the percentage of cure of those who relapse is actually only about 10%. So it's not very high, and that's why you want to prevent a relapse rather than deal with a relapse. So another question that patients ask, well, hmm, I'm 75, is chemotherapy advisable for me? So if your risks are high, there is you know, one study after another that shows that age is not as important in taking chemotherapy and that chemotherapy is gonna improve the overall survival of patients with colon cancer 
even if they are older than 70, and probably even if they're older than 80. So there is no age limit. We just have to be aware about the side effects of chemotherapy and manage them appropriately. So we've heard earlier that the average age is 64. But I think what is important to note that the median age is 70. So what's the difference between average and median? When I say the median age is 70, it means 50% of patients with colon cancer in the United States are older than 70. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an aging disease. We, we grow older and we get cancer, and, and that's unfortunate, but it's reality. So those 50%, even if they're older than 70, that's not old to receive a modality of therapy to reduce risk of relapse, and chemotherapy is manageable in those patients. So um, the benefit is seen across all age groups, um, and the quality of life may be affected, but not significantly. My patients play golf while getting adjuvant chemotherapy. Those who run businesses continue to run their businesses. Uh, basically, function 80% instead of 100%. So you, most of them, if they work, they have to skip two days every two weeks. Um, so chemotherapy, another miss is that it disturbs, you know, ability to go out. The first thing I tell patients is if you're getting chemotherapy, I want you to go out, I want you to socialize, I want you to meet with people, I want you to have to go to the movies, I want you to stay active. Moving, massage, exercise does not move the cancer. The more exercise there is, the less the recurrence. So patients need to maintain an active lifestyle and taking chemotherapy is not the end of the world as far as continuing to be active. Um, if there are side effects with the first round of treatment, we're not going to punish the patients and keep the same dose that's making them very sick. So there are strategies to reduce the chemotherapy dosing to make it tolerable. So a lot of patients who come and see me have family members who've got treatment for leukemia, for breast cancer, and start extrapolating from different chemos to their colon cancer, which is also not right. All right, so what can a colorectal cancer patient do to reduce their risk of relapse? And we've talked a little bit about this earlier. You've heard about lifestyle modifications to prevent having colon cancer. There is actually increasing evidence that after a diagnosis of colon cancer, you can reduce the chances of that same cancer reappearing if a patient does the following. Increased exercise level, and eating a non-Western diet. So it's been shown that people who eat non-Western diet have a little bit less risk of having a relapse after colon cancer compared to a Western diet. So I tell my patients, less pizza, less red meat, less burgers, cut the good stuff, basically. Um, so avoid a Western diet lifestyle, and more recently there's been a, a, a large study that has looked at carbohydrate intake. I mean, patients would come and say, well, should, should I take sugar? It feeds the tumor. And we said there's no evidence. Well, now there's evidence that very high carbohydrate level actually may indeed feed the cancer and may actually increase the risk of relapse. There's more data that is needed in those areas, but these are areas that at least a patient can do. So at least the simple sugars should be avoided somewhat. One thing I tell my patients is also consider an aspirin day. So there is actually more and more data that suggests that people who take an aspirin day have less colon cancer, less polyps. But there's also data that is emerging that shows that patients who have diagnosis of colon cancer resected and take aspirin after diagnosis of colon cancer may actually have less chance that the cancer would come back. I tell my patient to check with their primary care to make sure there's no contraindication. I don't want somebody to take an aspirin if they had a peptic ulcer with bleeding in the past. So another thing that we discussed on the first visit with my patients with colon cancer is what do we do as far as making sure this cancer doesn't come back. Now, this is a busy slide. It's just to show you that there is discord of years plus. And we, we developed this protocol where we do a CAT scan every six months for two years and then once a year for three years. And we do tumor markers, which are also very essential in following patients. It's called CEA. And that's checked every three months for two years and then every six months for another three years. So the, the only difference between our strategy is that we did a little bit more scans in the first two years as we did it every, two, every six months, rather, once a year. And as you can see from this slide, out of 177 patients with stage 2, 3 colon cancer, 44 relapsed. 143 did not, and all of these patients have chemotherapy, so that's expected. 25% will relapse with chemotherapy, 50% will relapse without chemotherapy or so. Now, out of those 44 patients with a relapse, because we were watching them, you know, like a hawk, uh, we actually were able to take 57% of those patients, 25 out of 44, for a salvage resection, their liver removed or a small part of the lung for a recurrence in the lung. 
19 out of the 44 were non-resectable, and this actually is the highest percentage that's been reported as far as resectability in, in the surveillance modality. The important thing is to note is that the blood was not enough in detecting this recurrence because 30 out of the 44 patients, we detected the recurrence first on a CAT scan. So radiographic uh, surveillance uh, is, is very important. Now, what this slide shows, the top line, is the number, of, is, the, is the basically what we call overall survival curve. And you can see on that curve that about 60% of patients, if you follow up to 72 months on the bottom, are still alive at resection. But those who did not undergo resection, even though you know, they lived on average two years, the majority are dead by five years, which tells you that chemotherapy, when the cancer comes back, can stop the disease, but not for a very, very long time. On average, the, the survival for metastatic colon cancer, stage four disease that is not amenable for surgery, is only two and a half years. But you can see that 60% of patients who had a resection of their recurrence, even though it wasn't in an organ, 60% uh, were alive at six years in our study. So, um, th this, actually, I don't think I'm going to skip this one. So, this is important information to show you how we manage and follow up these patients with colon cancer. But I also want to say that there is hope for patients who are not amenable for resection and that we're not looking at this cancer in, in a kind of a, uh, a very narrow uh, vision uh, will treat everybody the same. Uh, I think this is the era of personalized medicine. This is the era of individualized therapy. And no two, two tumors are the same, and no two people are the same. So everyone is different. Our, our goals are different. Our tolerance to treatment is different. Uh, and, and we have to look at it that way. Um, so one kind of uh, algorithm we follow when a patient door with advanced disease, the first thing we want to focus is what is the chance we can cure this patient. So if the patient can have their tumors resected, even if it's in the liver, we are working as a team, a surgeon, a medical oncologist, a pathologist, a radiologist, uh, an endoscopist, uh, to figure out what is the best way. If it is something we can cut out, we will do chemotherapy and resect that tumor to give the best outlook. If it's not resectable, but if we can shrink it, we can resect it. Those are patients who, what we call borderline resectable or unresectable, potentially resectable. We give them very strong chemotherapy to shrink the cancer, and then we cut the spread out. And if it's not resectable, we try to give the patient the best chemotherapy with the best quality of life that they can have with it. So this is an example on the left of a tumor liver that is riddled with these dots. That is a patient that cannot get treated, cured because you cannot leave enough liver that is cancer-free. So that is what we call non-resectable. In the middle, you have a tumor that is in the right lobe of the liver. If you cut the right lobe of the liver, you can potentially, you will make that patient cancer-free and you will probably get about a 30, 40% chance that this patient will be cured for good. And on the right right now, but if you shrink them enough, you can cut them out and potentially render the patient curable. So that's really how we look at a broad classification. But within these subgroups, we reclassify the patients molecularly, and we take a look at their performance status and make the best decision. Now, for the unresectable disease, I think there is, a, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, number one, we've made progress. Uh, these bars show you the number of months the patient lives when they present with a CT scan like the one on your left side, and you cannot cure them by resection. So those patients now have an average survival of about six months, somewhere between two and a half years and three years is the average. Uh, note that without treatment, that same person has an average of six months. And you can see that over the years with different regimens and different strains, those are going up. But this is a progress that took about 15 years to go from, or 20 years to go from about 10 months up to about 30 months. We really need to do more. Uh, I'm going to leave it at, at, an, at, at a note with, with a presentation of a patient to show you how there is a lot of variety in, 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 in our approaches and how we change course to kind of gain, which is roughly a year and a half before the tumors and spreading, responded to chemo, calcified again, and turned white. So she basically had about, you know, roughly a year, another year on that chemotherapy. And then, you know, unfortunately, she progressed. 
Well, since she didn't progress on oxaliplatin initially, she progressed on 5-FU Avastin. We had stopped oxaliplatin initially in eight, and she progressed in March 2008. So that's four years, and her disease was only in the liver. So what can we do for patients with disease in the liver? You can see her liver is still clean, has a lot of these white calcification, but on the left bottom side, you can see some areas of, of darkish coloration where you have that arrow. That is the active tumor. So in patients with liver disease only, we have a technique now where we can give some form of liquid radiation injected into the artery of the liver. And that goes through the artery. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, uh, we will sit down and take your questions. All right, uh, I'll start with uh, some of the questions here. Uh, with metastatic colorectal cancer, will gene therapy help? Uh, I would surely hope so. Someday we will make progress. There is evidence that it can help. Uh, there have been uh, some work looking at uh, gene therapy with P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, P53 is mutated or abnormal in a number of patients with colon cancer, roughly about half the patients. By the way, everybody hears me well through this mic? Yes? Okay. So the problem is how to deliver this gene and make the, the, the normal gene go into the, the, the tumor to, to work as a tumor suppressor. Uh, and there have been uh, viral vectors that have been uh, basically developed where you put the P53 gene and then you basically uh, infect the patient with the virus. And uh, you, typically you like to inject it either in the tumor or if it's in the liver, in the blood supply in the liver. There's been one study that has shown slight promise. It was not really a drastic uh, improvement, but the, the technique was so complex that no you know, active gene therapy that we have at Roswell, at uh, City of Hope, or institutes that I was at before. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think we are years away from having in a, this in a large uh, clinical trial in colon cancer. I have, a I have a question here asking about uh, what is a sessile polyp. Um, a sessile polyp is, uh, polyps come in uh, different shapes and forms. Um, I don't know if you remember the slide I showed you about the uh, CT uh, colonography where we had the, uh, uh, a large polyp with a stalk. That's called a pedunculated polyp. And those are really easy to see because they're just, it's kind of like a broccoli that's hanging inside the colon. It's e how polyp is where it's more not polyp. It's kind of flush to the uh, skin. And these polyps are a little bit more uh, harder to see and uh, they can be easily missed. Um, these are flat polyps. Um, if they grow large, they're a little bit more difficult to uh, remove because uh, they're so flat. The polyps that are on a stalk, you could just put a little lasso on it and just snip it off. But the ones that are just really flush to the skin, the sessile polyps, uh, they're a bit, little bit of more of a challenge to uh, remove and um, they're harder to see. And the uh, second part of the question is, uh, if your family has a history of colon cancer, should you get a fecal uh, cult blood test every year? And um, uh, I don't know if you remember from my, uh, the slide set that I showed you about the high risk patients. Those are the patients with a family of a, um, colon cancer. If you have a family history of colon cancer um, that's less than the age of 60, uh, the recommendation is to get a screening with a colonoscopy starting at the age of 40 or 10 years from the youngest uh, um, age of the uh, diagnosis of the colon cancer in the family. So um, should you get a fecal occult blood test every year? Um, you know, if you don't want to go through a colonoscopy, then you know, that's another way of doing screening. 
All right, I have a couple here. Uh, after a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, when do you screen for Lynch syndrome? And Lynch syndrome is a very specific disease. Uh, people would have a family history. Uh, that's why when we, you first meet one of us, one of the first questions we're going to ask you is, well, does, and depending on your answer to that, kind of strat, uh, stratifies you in a certain risk group. The second thing we look for is in every patient under age 45, automatically we screen for some of the main genes for Lynch cancer without your knowledge or without your um, even input. It's done automatically by the pathologist. So when I get the report back after having taken out a tumor in a young patient, I not only get the stage of the cancer, but I also get their gene makeup of the tumor. Now that's kind of a clue as to whether or not the patient should go on for further testing. So I put all those together with the family history and the analysis by the pathologist at the time of the resection, and then we make the decision together whether or not to pursue further genetic testing. Genetic testing is kind of tricky because most insurance companies have a hard time paying for it. It can be really expensive, and it has a lot of repercussions on you, on your family members, on your children and grandchildren, and their ability to get subsequent health insurance. So because of that, it's not a decision we take very lightly, and it involves a lot of discussion, especially with genetics here. We have an excellent clinical genetics program here at City of Hope, and we refer very commonly to them. Um, second part of this question uh, involves brachytherapy for rectal cancer. Just to fill everybody in, brachytherapy is a type of treatment that we give for some types of cancer, especially prostate cancer, where there's little beads, and the little beads are soaked pretty much with radiation. And these little radiation-soaked beads are inserted into the prostate, and they slowly over time elute their chemotherapy or their radiation therapy to the tissue and kill the tumor in the prostate. Unfortunately for rectal cancer, it doesn't work. Uh, for rectal cancer, we use external beam radiation, similar to getting an x-ray, um, and point it at the cancer and attack the cancer that way. Uh, there's no role for brachytherapy in rectal cancer. One CA is not a screening test. You know, if someone doesn't have history of colon cancer, don't go around saying, well, let me do my CA to see if I have colon cancer. If it's normal, then I don't have colon cancer. It doesn't work that way. It's a very lousy screening test for colon cancer. It's an okay test to survey or to follow up a patient who had their colon cancer removed. Even in that setting, and even in a patient where the colon cancer spreads to the liver, there's a 30% chance that the CEA may be normal. So a, a CEA that is normal doesn't mean that a patient is no way with a recurrence. And it's, it's, it's a, it, what it means if someone had their colon cancer removed, and a year later, when they come back and their CEA is normal, it means that it's less likely that there is cancer in their system. It doesn't mean that there is no cancer in their system. And that's why, you can, as I said earlier, you know, when we looked at our patients who recurred, CAT scan was more often the first sign of a recurrence. Um, so cancer can come back with a normal. I think that uh, is, is just an extra piece of information is that the CEA depends not really just on the colon tumor or rectal tumor, but where it recurs. So usually it recurs in the liver is much more likely to have a high CEA. A tumor that recurs in the lung, a colon cancer that spreads in the lung, is very likely to have a normal CEA. So if, if somebody had a local recurrence, the CA may still be normal. If they had a recurrence in the lungs, the CA may be normal or slightly elevated. If it's in the liver, much more likely to be elevated. 90% of liver recurrences will have a high CA. Uh, percent chance or actually more that a two centimeter lesion in the lung or an inch lesion in the lung will have a normal CA. Um, so that covers CA. Um, targeted therapy based on genetic makeup. So not all targeted therapy that we use is based on genetic makeup. And, and the, the word targeted therapy means that the, two, the, the, the agent that we are using or the drug that we are using has a target. Uh, now, it, it, it also part, it doesn't mean it's, it's side effects, uh, not prone to side effects because it has a target. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it has a wash on the rest of the body and it only works on the For example, Herbitox or Vactabix, two very commonly used use targeted agents in colon cancer, will attack a protein on the tumor called EGFR. So it targets EGFR, but that same protein is in the skin, so you see a lot of skin rash with it. So the, the term targeted therapy is based on the fact that you are targeting a target. Um, and is it based on genetic makeups? For certain targeted therapies, yes. For certain targeted therapies, no. So for Herbitox, because you're targeting a protein called EGFR, and that protein is irrelevant if you target it or not in somebody who has a KRAS mutation because KRAS will drive patients. So, so for, EG, for, for, EG, for EGFR targeting, 
uh, yes, genetic makeup of the tumor makes a difference. If it's KRAS mutant or, for that matter, if it's BRAF mutant as well, it's much less likely to work uh, or unlikely to work. And on the other hand, another targeted agent is called bevacizumab, or the word Avastin. You may have word, or heard of Avastin. It's a targeted monoclonal antibody or protein that attacks uh, a, a driver for blood vessel formation. Now, that drug is used in all patients with stage 4 disease, irrespective of the genetic makeup. We don't have, at this point, a target population that benefits from this compared to a target population that doesn't. So, so the answer to this question is yes and no. The molecular analyses, I think someone is asking what is the test that we use. Uh, at, at City of Hope, we use a test called ONCO44, and it's available through our molecular pathology that has KRAS, it has BRAF, it has NRAS, it has PIC3, it has a bunch of mine. Uh, there are similar tests in the community with different names. All right, we just have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try to group some of these together. Um, there's been a couple questions on diet um, after surgery. You know, the data on diet is, uh, on reducing your cancer risk is, as Dr. Fakir was saying before, it's very limited. Um, we don't have a whole lot of information, very little. Size of the polyp, and based on that, line recommendations on how often we should be doing the uh, follow-up uh, colonoscopy. All right, I think just a reminder, it's a question about review slide on lowering recurrence again in aspirin. So as we talked, uh, there's some data about that. Reemphasize physical activity. I think that's extremely important. Uh, central obesity, having a beer belly kind of uh, is, is associated with a high risk of colon cancer and other cancers. And there is certainly several studies that suggest that the more exercise, the less recurrence. Being physically fit and active uh, is extremely important. Dose of aspirin is really not very clear. There is data from s the studies on heart and stroke that 81 milligram was as good as 3 and the risk of these patients getting colon cancer being decreased. I typically advise my patients just to take a baby aspirin because I don't want to push them into a bleeding ulcer. Uh, and there's really no clear evidence that more than 81 baby aspirin, 81 milligram a day is better. So if I am to advise a patient, colon cancer has a marker called CA125, colon cancer is CA. What is important to note is that you cannot make a conclusive diagnosis based on the marker as far as to what type a cancer patient has. The CA can actually be high. That we're doing for 20 years to find out what causes cancer and what prevents cancer. So it could be you if you're not diagnosed with cancer. It could be your family member or your friends or your colleagues. And I have information there. And uh, you could go to our website to enroll, um, which is cps3la.org. Uh, there's many sites. Here at City of Hope, the enrollment um, is going to take place on May 9th, uh, which is Thursday. But you have to register and do online survey first. And um, you have to come to the enrollment site, draw a small um, sample of blood, and then they would do a waste measurement. And then every two years, you'll get a survey. And all you have to do is complete. This will save so many people's lives, and uh, you're going to make a difference. So we urge you to participate, and thank you. Again, thank you for joining us this evening, and you can help save others' lives through this study. So we'd appreciate your